Friend, welcome back. This is part two of the interview with Dr. John Jaquish. We dive into hormones and nutrition. Dr. Jaquish explains why it's bad to do cardio for more than 20 minutes at a time and how the X3 bar workout will turn up your testosterone and growth hormone. Finally, we also talk very importantly about nutrition and how you can eat to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. Stay tuned. So let me talk about a question that I got from a female audience uh, from my Instagram. And she said that, okay, great. This is good for men, but I just want to lose, you know, five to 10 pounds of weight. I don't want to add a bunch of bulk to my upper body. How will this help me? Well, the good news is most women are not eating enough protein to gain muscle anyway. And they also don't really have the hormones or hormone receptors to to get that, like, I mean, I'll be harsh when somebody says, oh, when I lift, I get big. And I'm like, no, when you eat cupcakes, you get big. Like, this is just, it's just in your head. Like, you know, any incredible female physique you see, women are like, oh my God, what's her program? Like, there's some secret around that. She does strength training. That's why she looks great. Like, a developed musculature on women makes women look more feminine, not less. And yes, there are the anomalies out there that take perform male performance enhancing drugs. And okay, yeah, they look a little masculine or a lot masculine. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's their goal. So for them, okay, you know, that's what they want to do. But uh, there are almost no women who can just pick up a strength training intervention, even a super powerful one like X3, and all of a sudden, oops, I look like a dude. Not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. yeah, you will look more feminine. Your waist will get narrower, your legs will get harder and more defined. Uh, there'll be a little bit of definition in the back. The arms will get thinner uh, and more defined. Like, that's what happens. You just look you go from looking frumpy to looking like, uh, you know, the, the, the statues in, in uh, you know, from the characters in Greek mythology. Oh, wow. I think that's a very good it's, aspiring it's, physique. It's, it's terrible that women are afraid of strength training because they're afraid to look like men. Like, yeah. No. It, besides, I have never, ever met a guy that didn't like a girl because she was like too strong. Like that's kind of awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like when I, when I meet a woman who strength trains, that's like, wow, like you're amazing. Yeah. Any guy that's into fitness, you're right. I don't Ooh, think would mind that at all. That. I yeah. mean, maybe there's some really like, you know, deconditioned guy out there that would be intimidated by that. But mm -hmm. do you really want to be with that guy anyway? Probably not. No. If he's ignoring his body, there's a lot more he's ignoring. Oh, yeah. And it's going to show oh, up in your... In your life. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So a lot of women, obviously, as you know, are doing cardio. They spend hours and hours and hours either running or doing cardio like hours per week. Right. So what's wrong with that approach, Dr. Jaquish? Um, a lot. The problem with cardio is it, uh, it chronically upregulates cortisol. Cortisol does two things in the body, gets rid of muscle and protects your body fat so you keep it longer because it wants to keep the fuel, mm -hmm. the storage system in the body so that you can go even further when, you, when you're doing your cardio. So it, it, it's giving you exactly the opposite. It's keeping you fatter longer and it's diminishing muscle and uh, increasing your chances of injury doing activities of daily living or even cardio. So, oh, you also lose bone density from it. So your bones become weaker. And uh, you have a, yeah. a higher chance of exaggerated kyphosis. So hunching forward, you know, and looking older. So cardio makes you look older, keeps you fatter. Um, yeah, I just, I don't think it's the solution to anything. Okay. Now, like I said, if you want to be a marathon runner, you got to run marathons. Yeah, but that's what you don't think it's for your health. Right. 
Okay, so is there a certain length of time that you're working out or doing cardio that the cortisol goes up and shuts down the positive benefits or like there's HIIT training, right? Yeah, you could say that's, 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 that's the crazy cardio. That works very different. It does not, HIIT training does not work like sustained cardio at all. Mm-hmm. In fact, because there's a self-stabilization aspect right. and the first and hopefully only meta-analysis I've ever authored with my same co-author, Henry Alkire, mm-hmm. um, in 2016, we wrote a meta-analysis on stabilization firing and upregulation of growth hormone. It's profound. And HIT training will give that to you. So totally different story. People who do high intensity intervals with, you know, sprints or whether, no matter what it, what it is, there's a lot of different things you can do. That's great. Now, I would almost say that X3 acts a little bit like that because the heart rate is going up and down. But I try to make that point and, you know, the uh, I, I read an article in Flex Magazine when I was in high school, uh, self-appointed experts. They didn't like that. I compared X3 training to high intensity. And I was like, all right, well, you know, high intensity interval isn't like a magic thing I need to say for people to go, aha, I understand it now. So I was like, all right, forget it. Okay. But uh, yeah, so self-stabilization exercise, which is always high intense. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're not doing something with low intensity and you're like losing your balance while you're doing it. Right, okay. So high intensity, obviously very good. I, I love that. I, I do it quite often because I've been a soccer player my whole life. So I love the sprints. Um, yeah. But I think uh, what I was going to, what I was asking you is for the cardio, for the cortisol, for sustained cardio to not be beneficial and instead be harmful, is there a period of time that uh, is bad or just all sustained cardio is not beneficial? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Yeah, don't go longer than 20 minutes. Okay. Then, it, then you don't have a problem. Okay. Yes, people who do like, oh, I did an hour of, you know, riding a bike. You know, mm-hmm. I did an hour of my Peloton. I'm like, mm, I'm going to get nothing out of that or right. you'll be worse. Well, okay. Peloton will sell that multi-thousand dollar bike to them to put in their basement. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I want to switch gears. We've been talking about the X3. We talked about muscle gain. We talked about fat loss. We talked about busy executives, athletes. We talked about men versus women. So we covered a lot. Thank you for that. Now I want to talk about a couple other things and we'll try to go faster on these. Uh, The first one is, uh, you know, the hormones, what hormones get released as you're doing the X3. I know you've made mention of testosterone, growth hormone, cortisol just now. And you also talked about uh, the myostatin, the that protein that can actually inhibit muscle growth uh, in the book. So maybe just touch on those four and then we'll get into nutrition very quickly to wrap this up. Testosterone gets upregulated when you put heavy loads on the body and also the receptor sites become active. So you need both. Mm -hmm. That was when the reason I brought up the enhanced athlete, these guys are very pro steroid. And I'm trying to say like, you know, your body does all this on its own. Like, now, does it do it to the degree of, of introducing uh, external hormone levels? No, not to the same degree. But you can definitely have a breathtaking physique and incredible strength, speed, power, uh, injury prevention you know, mechanisms in the body, all active and, and protecting you at all times without it. So, you know, for me, I got testosterone replacement therapy at 28 because I I had a testicular injury. Yeah, I played rugby. Yeah, sure. Basically a testicular injury. Uh, Yeah, I mean, you know. It's very very dangerous for for your man parts. It was dangerous to everything, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I just got hit really hard. That's no big deal. But uh, yeah, it limited me testosterone wise. And so I was told I'd probably have a heart attack in my 30s if I didn't get on testosterone. 
Wow. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. But of course, at the appropriate levels, testosterone yeah. replacement therapy replaces what's supposed to be there. And there's a, also a lot of fools on the internet who think like TRT is a prescription for anabolic steroids. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's at a replacement level. It's sort of like somebody who has a glass of wine a week is different than an alcoholic. Right. It's all in the dosage. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah. Um, So testosterone you get Mm -hmm. heavy. Growth hormone you get with self-stabilization and the only way you increase self-stabilization is by adding load. So when I'm doing, you know, like an overhead press, I push the weight over my head and I'm holding more weight than I could ever get above my head normally. And my core is just jackhammering with stabilization firing to keep me from falling over. Mm-hmm. And it's automatic. And the more that happens, the more your growth hormone goes up. And so the st- stability type movements, the overhead presses, the squats, the deadlifts, they have a strong influence on growth hormone. And, uh, and so that's, that's where that comes from. The next one you mentioned, uh, cortisol, I covered that when I was talking about, um, cardio. Now also it's an oversimplification to say like cortisol is bad. Cause like your, your body, you're not born with anything that's trying to harm you within your body. Right. Sometimes you end up with that stuff like a cancer cell or something like that, but everything you're born with is there to like help you out and cortisol included. It's a, it's a stress response. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a response hormone to a lot of things that are designed to calm you and slow you down because you, you kind of had enough and a short instance of cortisol is not a problem. In fact, it's normal. After every workout, your cortisol goes up. After getting out of bed, your cortisol goes up and then goes down. Mm -hmm. So it's not a problem. It's the chronic high that will encourage even increasing your level of body fat. So like there's been some research that more, more stressed people, people that don't have any relaxation, they got some problems. And their, their cortisol is high and they get fatter quicker. So, uh, again, no such thing as a bad hormone, but, uh, that one will do some bad things if it's always high. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And- uh, last thing you mentioned was myostatin. Mm-hmm. Now we use hypoxia by, by keeping constant tension and the constant tension that we use with the protocol, this is why I tell people, like, you, know, like, you look at the 12-week program and they're like, hey, what about if I add? And I'm like, this is the way. Right. Just, yeah. yeah. Watch The Mandalorian. This is the way. Just don't ask me questions. And because, like, I don't want to have to go and, like, give a lecture on, on hypoxia and, and uh, that basically means, like, trapping – most of the blood within a muscle, not letting it out. So you can truly exhaust the cell of ATP glycogen and creatine phosphate. If I say that to most people, they're, they're done. They're, yeah. you know, when I get to like ATP, they're like, how old is this guy? I don't know, like, there's way more information than I want. I'm not gonna remember it anyway. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you use constant tension and you get the same actually or more effect uh, like a blood blood flow restriction banding, like you don't need that. Your body does it anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it doesn't work very well with regular weight training, but with variable resistance at the level we're delivering the variance, mm-hmm. very powerful. Okay. And by showing the body that some of your musculature is missing, like blood's not going into it or out of it while you're doing the exercise mm-hmm. because you're not locking out at the top and you're not resting at the bottom. You're just keeping constant tension, going through slow controlled repetitions. As soon as you're done with the exercise, blood rushes in. But that that short period of time, that minute or minute and a half, the body's saying, wow, we lost some muscle. We can't find it. It's like it's gone. 
Mm-hmm. So we should downregulate myostat so we can put some muscle back because it like, apparently that's, that's the axis. Yeah. It's a cardiac axis for, for myostat. And, it, and like, when you look at all the research, you got to look at the entire body literature before really coming to that conclusion. But after reading all things about myostatin regulation, it's, it's pretty clear it's cardiac axis. Uh, and, and really what, what was like figured out is like they would do blood flow restriction on extremities, but then they would show that the pecs would grow in, in, you know, in correlation. Well, the pecs are not being constricted. Right. You you can't put a tourniquet around your neck. (laughs) No, you can't, you can't keep, you can't keep the heart from pumping blood to the pectorals, but they grow anyway. So it's really got nothing to do with blood flow restriction tools. Mm -hmm. It has to do with restricting blood flow. Well, your own physiology can do that with variable resistance and maintaining uh, constant tension. Okay. Well, great to know. I've got a blood flow restriction band that I've got sitting around somewhere, but I haven't used it. Uh, But the reason I was interested, uh, so you're saying don't use it. Okay. Uh, But the reason I was interested in myostatin is because a friend of mine, Liz Parrish, she owns a gene therapy company and she's trying to bring it to the masses, which as you can tell with regulatory approvals and FDA, it's it's just a nightmare, but she's working on it. Uh, And obviously she's attacking this from some of the uh, disease states that you get when you're much older than just muscle development, right? And uh, Uh, just just so you know, like the moment that's out, it's going to be used to cheat in sports. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, so, like, yeah. like everybody who hears my own expression is not like, wow, we could really help a lot of people with muscle wasting diseases. They're like, let's cheat at sports. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly how it's going to be used. But, um, yeah, uh, your body kind of does it anyway. Now, depending on the degree to which my statin can be altered, uh, that can be very powerful. In fact, like if anybody in, there's actually a picture in the book of a Belgian blue cow. I saw that. It's, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Like that cow wasn't given any extra anabolics. Mm-hmm. It just had its myostatin down regulated. And that's a much more powerful effector on growth than even testosterone. Maybe. So, maybe yeah. Yeah. So like, I'd really like, I like that direction of research. Um, of course the problem is now they, they created, uh, there's some researchers that created, a like an antibody that would attack myostatin. Mm. It was almost like a virus that would destroy that particular protein in the body. And uh, they gave it to mice Mm -hmm. and the mice all died of heart attacks. They got, Totally muscular, and then their heart couldn't <laughs> the muscle, and then they had a heart attack. Wow. So, my sentence there for a reason. Yeah. It's not like a cruel joke from your central nervous system or God or, you know, whatever you think screwed you together. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, that's a thing. So, yeah. uh, down regulating, my, no, needless to say, this antibody was not approved for human trials. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, and uh, but there are yeah. people who I'm sure would have tried it, and I'm right. pretty sure would have died. Yeah, the uh, the reason I brought that up is she, Liz, actually did gene therapy to prove to the world that this is going to be safe and whatever time it takes. But she got a myostatin inhibitor into her cells, and she got a telomerase activator to increase the telomere size, so yeah. you know she ages more slowly. Again, I, I she didn't become muscular by any means. Uh, she was just the same way. So. Huh? Did she exercise? She does not exercise, uh, but she's skinny. Just like, I don't think it's a huge difference where you go and you say, wow, Liz, you're, you know, big difference. But uh, interestingly, maybe in 20 years when this is all safe, every nerd can look like Dr. Jake Wish or Dwayne Johnson. Well, just you're by- still going to have to do the exercise. <laughs> okay. like, there's no getting away from heavy. Okay. Like, but I mean, you might have X3 and you might be down regulating myostatin and yeah. And you can have a, it'd be easier to get an incredible physique, but I mean, ultimately you can put the building blocks in the body 
you can give all the steroids in the world to somebody who just drinks Mountain Dew and plays PlayStation all day long, and right. they're going to look like shit. Right. Definitely. Okay. In the I same wanna, way, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to move to nutrition in just a second, but I think I'm going to split uh, the podcast into two. So I want to recap what you just said about the hormones in particular. So what you've said, Dr. Jaquish, is that heavy, heavy weight is going to activate or release testosterone in your body. It's also going to activate the testosterone receptors in your body, which are very important because they go hand in hand. Um, and that will provide the anabolic effects of testosterone where you can actually gain muscle. Now, growth hormone is also activated by using your technology, the X3 band. And what that's going to do is that, that's going to protect your muscle and it's going to help you lose fat. So that's a double whammy, double anabolic effect that you get yeah. uh, from using this by lifting heavy weights. And um, we talked about myostatin and then cortisol, I think, um, is a problem when you are doing cardio for more than 20 minutes or more at a sustained pace. If you're doing sprints or HIIT training, then that's not even an issue. And that's generally regarded as good by most of the medical community. And you approve that as well. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So let's move on to the other pillar. If one pillar is the exercise, the heavy weights, the other one's definitely the nutrition. And so what do people eat during this 12 week program and then moving on from there for your recommendations? Well, I try and keep it as realistic as possible, but when, when doing the research on just how, like what kind of nutrition you need to optimize muscle growth. Now, I approach health uh, probably a little differently than some other people who write about it. Uh, what are the things that we know about long life that are indisputable or thus far indisputable because everything in science can be challenged? Um, unless you want to talk about gender or global warming. <laughs> Um, Let's yeah, it now. <laughs> right, right. Oh, we don't want to do any more research on that. Okay. <laughs> right. I'm sure you don't. Um, so what, what we're, what we're looking at is, um, conflicting, uh, you know, we want to avoid the conflicting things. Like what do we know for sure is the biggest driver of long life? Turns out it's high level of strength. And the second thing is low level of body fat. Okay. So they go hand in hand. The stronger you are, the more muscle you have, the leaner you are. Uh, and the easier it is to maintain your leanness with more muscle mass because that's an engine running all the time. So how do we get as strong and as lean as possible? Well, that answer is also a very difficult challenge. It would be high levels of animal protein, and low levels of inflammatories. So, and then I, I also really like some of the effects of uh, time-restricted eating, fasting. Mm -hmm. So, so when you want, like, let's say eat one meal a day, and then you look at like some of the things that you would. Um, potentially eat or think are healthy, but then you look at the protein requirements to grow muscle. You don't have room in your intestines for much else. So, you know, I'll eat two or three pounds of meat a day in one meal and that's it. Wow. Two to yeah. three pounds of meat. Yeah. That's definitely a lot of meat. Are yeah. You... And that's every day I eat. Now I also do 72 hour fasts once a week. Oh, uh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, I eat, you know, like five, like, so like Sunday, midday will be like my last meal. Mm -hmm. And then I won't eat anything for the rest of Sunday. Nothing Monday, nothing Tuesday. And then Wednesday afternoon, uh, which actually I just had a huge meal right before uh, talking to you. But that was my first meal since Sunday. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, the, so I all about the time restricted eating and then and then uh you know go back to having large uh animal protein meals i think i had um a whole bunch of tuna uh i got a half pound of tuna 
Uh, I had eight sausages, six scrambled eggs with cheddar cheese, and then, um, oh, yeah, and eight ounces of ground beef. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's like a, 150 grams of protein. That's yeah. a good heaping of protein. And, and do you only eat one meal a day then? Usually today, it's my father's birthday today. So yeah, oh. um, yeah and, uh, we'll have a dinner like, like right after this. I'm, I'm going. Okay. I'm sorry I'm no. holding you up, but I will. Have no, it. no, it's good. It's good. I, um, I told you I got a podcast and they understand. It. Okay. I, I actually love that you're combining something, which we'll talk about in a second, the animal protein mm. uh, with fasting, because what I've heard in longevity research by Dr. Walter Longo and others is that high levels of protein can actually spike or increase your levels of IGF-1. IGF-1 is a pro-growth hormone, which causes your body to be growing in an anabolic state all the time. And what you want to do for a longer life is to reduce IGF-1 so you're, you're you know, doing cycles like feast and famine. So you're catabolic for a while. So you want to be anabolic at times, mm -hmm. and then you want to be not anabolic at times. Right. And uh, you'll actually grow more. There's there's a section of the book that talks about anabolic acceleration, and the people who do ex like the like significant time restricted eating, forty eight hour fasts or longer, they'll grow more muscle. So their anabolic state is more powerful, and going back and forth will long term build more musculature than trying to stay in an anabolic state at all times. Mm -hmm. So I, my point is you can have it all. You can be wow. really, really big and powerful and live a long time. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Now, it totally reconciles with their findings. Yeah. The other finding that a lot of people quote is that eating more than 20% of your daily intake from protein, especially animal protein, has been linked to higher rates of cancer and I believe cardiovascular wow. disease. Yeah. That, that is on CNN because that's fake news. Uh, that's, yeah, it, it, um, what that came from was one study about colorectal cancer mm -hmm. where they found a group of people who had uh, what they said was animal protein, what they only disclaimed in the, the survey detail section of their study was that these people ate nitrate meat every day for 40 years. Now, nitrate meat is like an Oscar Mayer hot dog. Mm. You, so they found a group of people, I think it was something like 4,000 people, who ate an Oscar Mayer hot dog every day for 40 years. I mean, so pretty much they, they got their, their source of nutrition was like gas stations. Because you can't even get that at a fast food restaurant, right. nitrate meat. Yeah. So... If somebody's eating their meals at gas stations, is there a chance that they might drink more alcohol than the average? Maybe smoke some cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Maybe do hard drugs like yeah. meth. I mean, when I see somebody buy, I mean, I'm general generalization here, and uh, as a scientist, I probably shouldn't do that, but it's kind of amusing. So, yeah, like when when I see somebody buying a hot dog at a gas station they're not doing it for their health i don't even need to ask yeah so uh, yeah it's like okay so you found a group of people who are on a war path of self-destruction for 40 straight years mm -hmm. and they had a two percent greater chance of colorectal cancer you just proved nothing because there's so many other variables in that and that's where that whole thing comes from there's other studies where people are eating more protein uh, heavy diets for performance purposes and the opposite is found. Or, or they go to countries where, you know, like only meat is available. Like you go to uh, places like Moldova. It's kind of too cold there to grow vegetables, but they have a lot of cattle. They grow grass. Grass will grow in the cold. So you know, they'll eat more animal-based meals, uh, same thing with like Kazakhstan and, um, you know, like a certain parts of Russia <clears throat> where it's like animal protein is just easier to get. And so they, they eat that and they live longer than the people that live in regions where they're 
uh, eating more and more plant-based, but also they're not controlling for things like stress and happiness, like the blue zones where people live to be a hundred. Vegans love to bring this up because it's like, oh yeah, everybody's eating all vegetables in all those places. Number one, that's a total lie. Number two, um, the biggest factor that's non nutritional or physical is low levels of stress. So they're happier more. So these are, these are places where, you know, they don't put old people in old people's homes. They put them with the kids. So the old people get to play with the kids. Like that's like a common thing in a lot of these areas. So we got to keep mental health in mind when it comes to, uh, triggering cancers and especially, uh, I'm sure you, you know, um, a name slipped my mind. Uh, yeah, I'll think of it in a second, but, uh, used to be head of, um, cancer research at Stanford. And now he teaches in New Zealand. If you think of who I'm talking about, please throw his name out. I can't, name doesn't come to my mind. Uh, yeah, brilliant guy. Okay. And he talks about how like stress is really the trigger for almost all cancers. Uh, that in, you know, the chronic cellular inflammatories we ingest, but stress and cortisol, stress you know, and cortisol is an inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And so when cells are in a constant state of inflammation, they decide to self-destruct. Yeah. Okay. Fair. I know yeah. that there's just more, there's more variables than just yeah. like, you know, eating meat. It's like, right. is it a hot dog? Is it somebody who's, you know, like on a, on a nu nutrition and health program that would describe them as a meth addict? Well, okay. Well, why, why is this person in the study then? Fair. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting about the carnivore diet when you talk about eating, you know, 150 grams of protein from, from animal meats. Uh, when the f people started doing the carnivore diet, I thought it was the stupidest idea ever because that much, like nobody except the Eskimo have probably eaten that much meat in the history of humankind. But it, people that are eating clean meat, grass fed, nose to tail, yeah. their biomarkers are surprisingly pretty good. good. You know, skin's clearing up. I'm hearing not even anecdotal, but uh, people that I know talking about it. So I'm getting more curious about it. So, uh, you know, given that, I think there's, that throws all this into confusion where yeah. maybe that study isn't the end all be all. There's more factors behind it. Also, okay. that study was done by Seventh-day Adventists who it's part of their religion to make everybody else eat only plants. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then also like some of the other studies, like I said uh, earlier when we were just talking, the, uh, the most of the the vegetable, you know, like we should eat. The conclusion is we should eat plant based uh, stuff is funded by Nabisco or you know the the medical groups that are funded by Nabisco fund the study. Mm -hmm. And Nabisco knows that vegans and vegetarians are not eating vegetables. They're eating Oreo cookies. They're drinking Coca-Cola. They like packaged products because if you actually try and eat a diet of all vegetables, you'll probably die of malnutrition very quickly because you can't get enough calories. So you got to get them concentrated. How do you get them concentrated? Processed foods. Well, that's what they do. So, there's a huge bias there and you got to look at funding sources. And the, even when it says like such and such medical group, find out who funds that medical group. I think that's really Probably important. Being the yeah. Best guy. yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. A uh, few more rapid fire questions about nutrition, obviously get enough protein. Uh, what about carbs, fiber, fat? How much should people eat of that? I would say fat uh, usually just comes with whatever cut of meat you get, and there's just nothing you really do about it. Just eat it. Uh, it's more satiating than protein, so you need it. Like, like uh, I think I actually don't get enough fat on my diet. I've kind of been kicking that around because I, I like keeping the calories pretty tight, mm -hmm. but the protein high. 
I'm kind of toying with the idea of really upping that, um, which will probably be like a quarter pound of liverwurst a day. Mm -hmm. I'll just throw that, you know, into the, into the meal plan. Uh, I like liverwurst. Delicious. Yeah. Okay. Try, try to feed it to the you know, friends I have and they're like, I'm never coming over again if you serve this. <laughs> um, so that's okay. I can eat the whole thing. Uh, so uh, yeah. And then carbohydrates, uh, you don't need fiber. Like if your toilet's plugged up, you throw a towel in there and flush the toilet five times because you got to get more stuff through the pipe to clear it out. No, that's not how things work. And uh, fiber doesn't help you uh, digest things or move things along at all. Uh, that's total myth. Um, in fact, carbohydrates don't even fit the definition of a macronutrient anymore. Now that we know what we know in the last 10 years, uh, they serve no purpose other than how, and it's, it's, this is most easily seen in a, in a bear's nutritional model, Bears give themselves type 2 diabetes every year before hibernation by gorging themselves on high fructose type uh, foods like honey, like, uh, like berries. And so that's how they get fat because they can live off their fat while they're just kind of hiding out underground. So bears get like I want to repeat that bears give themselves type 2 diabetes every year. Which kind of makes you think is type two diabetes a dysfunction of the human body or is it a function of the human body to help you get as fat as possible? That makes sense. When you look at what the bears do and you look at how tight, like why would our body go into a mode of like hyper fat storage if that could kill us? Well, for a brief period of time, it could help us. If we're going to be in freezing cold temperatures, being fatter means you're better insulated. Also, you can go without a meal for months at a time and live off the adipose tissue. You need to sit there and digest your own big fat gut, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's how it works. So, so, yeah. I mean, I know that's a really controversial thing to say, but I can back it up. So, it makes me go, okay, yeah, carbohydrates can have their place. Now, somebody asked me, is there anything nice you can say about carbohydrates? I'm actually getting more hate for being an anti-carbohydrate guy than, than for, like, anything else. And I get, I get a lot of haters. Uh, it, it's just jealous losers. There's losers. They're mad they haven't done anything in life. And everybody who's successful is obviously a jerk. Uh, it's like, I, I look at, look at what people have to say about like Jeff Bezos. It's like, right. okay, but he's also the richest guy. So yeah. You know, yeah. So he's doing uh, something right. Yeah. He built it, built a business that everybody uses mm -hmm. the people that bitch about him. It's like, I bet you use Amazon, don't you? For sure. So, yeah. Right. So, um, when, you know, somebody asked me, is there anything nice you, you could possibly say about carbohydrates? I thought about it. I thought, I mean, yeah, like there are some things that happen, like replacing muscle glycogen. Like if, you, if you're depending on gluconeogenesis, that takes a long time. You know? Yeah. Like maybe full 24 hours. Mm -hmm. But... You consume carbohydrates, it might happen in half an hour. So like, I kind of looked at hydration and then it got me going down uh, a path of research, which was mostly championed by um, uh, um, a professor at Florida State. Um, Not remembering his name either. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jose, uh, damn, I'm just not remembering his last name right now. So Normally, I'm really good at that. Uh, but the um, what 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 he kind of came up with was looking at hydrating muscle, stretching it for the purpose of like superhydration of the muscle, mm -hmm. and uh, 
and then accelerated growth from there. And then when I started looking at, so I'm like, okay, well, what else would give super hydration? Well, vasodilation would. So what's the most powerful vasodilator that is readily available? Viagra. Mm-hmm. It so happens that people take Viagra grow, grow muscle faster. Huh. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, it was sort of a, I mean, there's just a few articles on it. And you can't really go to your doctor and say, I want Viagra so I can grow muscle faster. They don't even know that. So they'll be like, no. But, you know, it's pretty easy to say I, I need Viagra because I you know, want to do a better job, you know, with pleasing my partner. Okay, I'm going to give it to you in a yeah, second. There you go. Right. So, so I thought, okay, what happens if we combine a little bit of carbohydrates and a vasodilator? And there are non-prescription vasodilators like epimedium uh, or um, gl- uh, glycerol, mm-hmm. uh, which you can just get at any health food store. And you can take those things and uh, hyperhydrate the musculature and then stretch it while it is hyperhydrated. And when you do that, uh, you actually are stretching the casing of the muscle and you can create the opportunity for even more accelerated growth. So that is a way you can use carbohydrates in conjunction with a vasodilator. Uh, and stretching after your workout because that's when blood comes into the muscle. So, and, and, and that's, that's a, a hyperplasia protocol because that'll actually, when you, when you stretch out the cells like that, that'll cause the cells to divide. And uh, Jose Antonio, Professor Jose Antonio. Antonio. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good to know. I'll have to uh, reach out to you after and get some more details on the protocol, unless it's already documented somewhere. Now. It's yeah. well documented in the book. I went so heavy in the detail and okay. I actually got trolled for that. Like, you know, people gave me like bad reviews on Amazon because it was like, oh, nobody cares about any of this. And it's like, yeah, they kind of do. And uh, when you write a book, mm-hmm. and you leave out detail. Well, then you, you know, you screwed up. You didn't write a very good book. Right. The reason books exist is for details, not not for the big picture, unless it's a coloring book. But a lot of people in fitness can probably only digest a coloring book. So, you know, it's there's a reason. Say, let me say this. I love saying this. There's a reason that most fitness information. I don't mean biohacking. You know, like that's that's a much more intelligent population. Fitness information is mostly Instagram and YouTube pictures and videos. Why? Because fitness fans can't read. <laughs> 12% if you listen to Jordan Peterson 12% of the population is only intelligent enough to mop the floor anything else this is why the military won't take the bottom 12% uh, intelligence quotient because they'll these are the people that will shoot their own troops you know in the back by accident because they'll forget to unload their gun Thanks. Uh, so so uh, you know I, I remember hearing that from Professor Peterson and I was like, "Really? There's people out there that are that dumb." And then I and then somebody showed me what people were saying on Bodybuilding.com, and I was like, "Oh, I found them! Here they are! <laughs> this is the bottom twelve percent." And Bodybuilding.com. Oh, by the way, speak speaking of carbs, so we we could talk about that for an hour. By the way, oh, um, yeah. but speaking of carbs, I've got this um, this monitor, right. continuous glucose monitor that I've been using to track. Uh, my blood glucose variations, and of course, eating white bread or anything causes it to spike. I don't eat enough of it to have a meaningful spike, which is good. Um, but I've been monitoring that, so it'd be interesting to kind of like add a lot of the, you know the diets and nutrition and kind of see how that does. Now, the other question I want to ask you is: Yes, working out ten minutes. Of course, you're doing like muscle to failure with the X3. Do you do that in a fasted state, or do you eat something before you do that? And if so, how long before do you eat? I can do it. No, no problems. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. When your body needs to perform, it, it, like, yeah, you lose muscle glycogen a little bit mm-hmm. fast. I mean, it goes down maybe like 10%. You got a lot of juice in the tank and your body makes sure you do. And mm-hmm. gluconeogenesis still happens even in a fasted state because you're metabolizing your old cells. Got it. 
Okay, so you can do the X3 in a fasted state. How long should you wait before you eat? Or is there no number? I, I think eating after your workout, like there's no such thing as like the anabolic window. Like, oh, you have to eat right away. So all of it can go to muscle growth. Like you really grow at night when you sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why it doesn't really matter when you get your nutrition during the day. And that's been proven in plenty of studies, more meals, less meals. It doesn't make a difference. Oh, man. You get yeah. The target amount of protein you're going to grow could all be in one meal. Yeah. Uh, but if you're going to do that carbohydrate protocol, if I go like three or four hours where I'll have a workout and then have the vasodilator. Well, first the vasodilator and then the workout and then the carbohydrates and then the stretching. Uh, three or four hours later, I don't feel so great. Like I, it's just like you're tapped. Like having a really good meal after that is a good idea. Okay. So I, I, part of the reason I like working out, I prefer to work out like towards the end of the day because then I just have dinner. Yeah, me too. I love it around 4 or 5 p.m. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me ask you about BCAAs, your position. Garbage. Garbage. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. And there's plenty okay. of research on that. that. That's not my, I didn't even go into that in the book. Like, branch chain, they're, it's all the wrong ratios. So it's like, yes, it is the amino acids you use during exercise, but it's not the amino acids that get put together to build muscle. Mm -hmm. So and you should, yeah. It doesn't do anything. Just yeah, I've, I've heard that from a couple. Of, yeah. yeah, I've heard that from a couple of other people across. So great. Um, so BCA is out. Essential aminos should be should you be taking that in pill form or get it from the meats or the foods that you eat? Given those options, meat. Uh, you know, there is there is a supplement that I mean, full disclosure, I put this out. Uh, Fortigen, it's bacterial uh, fermentation byproduct, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it gives you the right ratio of essential amino acids. It's the most anabolic protein I've ever seen. So I'll get like a hundred, like today, I got 150 grams of protein. I'll probably have another 50 later. I won't have a very big you know, meal for, for my father's birthday. Um, I'm sure my mom probably made some like pastries or cake or something and i'll have to move it around my plate and make it look like i ate something but you know i'm not eating that shit yeah. uh but don't tell my mom uh okay. so so then um you know then i'll have some fortigen later which will take care of the rest of my protein requirement but uh it's really easy to digest you digest in 20 minutes it's just like clear like lemonade mm -hmm. uh yeah it's fine Okay, cool. So get Fortigen. What, so, what's your take on weight? Essential amino acids. That, it, it, the essential amino acid needs to be made in the right way. So a lot, there's a lot of essential amino acid products that don't do anything because they weren't really they weren't made with fermentation. Mm -hmm. And okay. also the they're probably copying somebody else who got the ratios wrong. Mm -hmm. But where Fortigen came from was a cancer treatment. Mm. And it was it was proven to help with um, lowering muscle or eliminating muscle wasting during chemotherapy and radiation. Mm -hmm. And so I made a few changes to make it a little more anabolic, mm -hmm. and uh, and then launched it. Awesome. Um, okay, a couple more last questions. What's uh, your take on pre workout? Uh, depends what's in it. Most of them are just like a chemical shitstorm. Like a whole bunch of stuff I would not put on my yeah. body. Yeah. Uh, now, I, here, here's another, I, I mean, I don't want to just pat myself on the back, but uh, I, I came out with one myself called Imperium. Mm -hmm. And that one has medium chain triglyceride for appetite suppression and energy. Uh, it doesn't have, like each serving has 200 milligrams of caffeine. I, there are pre-workouts with 800 milligrams of caffeine. Wow. You, that, 800 that, milligrams? What? That'll jack you up, 800 milligrams. You no, know, you feel like garbage. You can't even work yeah. out. Yeah. Like totally counterproductive. Wow. But a lot of people think more is better, right? Sure, sure. It's, uh, people just do that. So, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know. Like, I, I look at those people, I just shrug my shoulders, and I'm like, all right, if you don't want to learn anything, then. Keep going, but you're just going to have shitty workouts. You're not going to grow. 
Uh, so I prefer a lower level of caffeine with a little bit of beta alanine, mm -hmm. which gives you more energy than a higher level of caffeine, but it doesn't have the side effects of a high level of ca caffeine. Got it. So Imperium is the, is the preferred pre-workout, but yeah, I mean, I, I believe in, in that before a workout, um, and then we, what's funny, when you work out, you actually undo what caffeine does because you vasodilate instead of vasoconstrict. Right. Your body forces basically the caffeine to be negated. But going into the workout, you felt a higher level of energy because of the vasoconstriction, your heart rate going up. As soon as you start exercising, your heart rate stays up. So you maintain the energy. So it's really kind of funny. Like, yeah you really have it for like the first set and then your body's like, no, 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 we're not, we're not doing that vasoconstriction thing anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but it works. So yeah, I, uh, I'm in favor. Okay. Uh, if I haven't said this already, I am going to get on the 12 week program in just a few days and I am Good. going to take before and after pictures shirtless. I'm not an investment banker, so I can do that. That's right. Uh, the biohackers get away with that stuff. So we'll do it before. The investment bankers get away with it too. They just have to not, you know, be self-conscious. Right, right. Um, so yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to take your recommendations and I'm uh, excited to gain a few pounds of muscle. I won't say how much because again, it's bio-individual probably. Um, so I'm excited to do this. How much uh, quality protein are you going to be getting today? You're going to get a gram per pound of body weight? I'll do your recommendations. I, I've, I've been following the longevity recommendations, which are 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 per gram of body weight you per pound, um, but I'll do more. Um, yeah, and, and we'll go from there. It'll be great. Awesome. I can't wait. Now, Dr. Jake Wish, where can people find you and get your book online? Please uh, plug your URLs. Uh, I put everything on a landing page so people only have to go one spot and get to me on social media, the book. You can find out about X3. It's drj.com. Doctor spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R-J dot mm -hmm. com. That's easy. Yeah. Drj.com. I think I'd gone to the x3bar.com. Uh, I believe you have that one as well. And I was looking at the program. But doc, if you're listening to the show, go to drj.com. This is a great device. It's high quality. And the results are being proven by serious athletes that are getting results themselves. They're already elite and they're getting results. So if you're serious about your health, you can go to the gym anyway, so this would be a great investment of your time and money to get ripped in a shorter time. So, uh, Dr. Jake Wish, thank you so much for coming on the show. Great. Yeah, I really appreciate you, and I can't wait to share my results with you soon. Awesome.